Thank you very much for coming. Today I'm going to talk to you about what I do for a living, which is pretty fun, but it also comes with, with its own set of challenges. It's also going to be fun because my team, some of them are actually here. This is not about you. It's about the others who are not here. You, are, you, you guys are a breeze. There are no struggles with you. This is about the rest of the team, basically. <laughs> um, a quick who am I about me. My name is Ahmed Sobeh, which is going to be very difficult to pronounce, but that's okay. I'm an engineering manager at Ivan's Open Source Program Office. I am on the advisory board uh, for the Joomla Foundation, and you can find some links uh, to my socials if you want to connect with me later on. So usually I start this talk by asking people who knows what an OSPO is, but I guess there's no point in doing that because I think everyone here does know that, which is good. I think year on year, I get more hand raises when I ask, uh, well, month on month even, when I ask what, uh, what if people know what an OSPO is. Uh, every second company would have an OSPO now, but they come in very different shapes and forms. It depends on what the company needs or what the organization needs, basically, to do going forward. Uh, for example, I work at Ivan. We have a data uh, platform, so our OSPO is very upstream focused because the existence of the company depends on upstream projects, basically. So that's what our OSPO focuses on. Other OSPOs might focus on legal uh, stuff and being reviews. Others might focus on community building. Depends basically on what the company or the organization needs, which is also good to see. Uh, also, people who are on the to-do group can actually experience that and see it uh, during the discussions that we have on it very different perspectives and very different issues and problems that people face in different OSPOs. Um, today I'm going to focus on the issues that I faced at our uh, shape of OSPO, which some of them are actually common in other kinds, but let's uh, go through them. But before, before that, let's just take a quick stop and look at an average OSPO. If we look at 10 companies with OSPOs, five or six of them are going to gonna look like this structure. It's a oh, sorry cross-functional team embedded in your organization. Uh, the team would have open, open source developers, program managers, project managers, uh, legal. It depends on your needs. The team would be the center of competency for the organization's open source operations and structure. If you want to ask anything open source related, this is your team to go to. The team oversees open source software management and strategy, when to open source what, what to use when, what's going to change license uh, and what's dangerous to use. All of this open source uh, knowledge and expertise would be in your team. And the team also oversees open source library selection, license compliance, workflows and stuff like this. So if you want to ask about anything related to which libraries to use, which you should avoid, that's the team to go to. So this is what an average OSPO looks like, and one that's not fitted to the needs of a special case company like the one that we have at Ivan. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. What does our OSPO look like? I I'm, I'm keep talking about how special it is, but let's see how it, if it's actually special. We have almost 15 people working 100% on upstream projects, nothing else, no side jobs, just contributing upstream, making sure the projects are healthy, sustained, and maintained. Out of those 15 people, we hire five maintainers of our dependencies as a company, our direct dependencies, the projects that we mostly uh, most depend on. We also have two maintainers of other projects that we do not depend on, but we still have people who are maintainers for them. And when I say our dependencies, these are the projects that I uh, that, that I mean: Open Source, ClickHouse, Link, Postgres, Cassandra, Kafka, and most recently Valky. We've been helping with the uh, forking efforts for Valky. So this kind of OSPO is very, as I said, focused on upstream contributions, which comes with a very different set of attributes. And because it's obviously anyone who has been in management or managed any sort of team, I wouldn't say management is easy for an average product team, but, it's still, but at least there is some uh, blueprint that you can follow. You've seen people manage other teams. You've managed different teams, different companies. You know what to do, basically, what, where to start, how to go about dividing stuff between the team members, how to manage the team culture. All of this has sort of a blueprint. But for a team like this, it's a bit difficult because there isn't really a blueprint for something like this. So what are the attributes of an OSPO team that looks like this? This looks like a database, especially with the word distributed, but it's not. It's just something that I put a word in. <laughs> the team is dis uh, distributed, and that's something that came with COVID, I would say. It's not really something that's specific to OSPOs, but 
all OSPOs are mostly distributed, so you can hire the best talent everywhere, all over the world. Uh, the team being distributed has lots of pros, but it also has some cons. Of course, you have talents from all, all over the world, so you have to have a distributed team. The team has different cultures and backgrounds, which is, in my opinion, also, uh, always a good thing, but it also has some challenges communicating different things for people from different cultures and backgrounds requires some effort on your behalf to do, basically. It's not as straightforward. They live in different time zones, but that's the essence of open source, really. It's uh, not a huge issue, given if you have people who have experience with open source, they should be able to deal with this. And they have different work routines. So if you're hiring people who have been working in open source for a long time, they have very different work routines. They contribute to open source in different parts of their day. So when they change that to become their full-time job, it's, it goes through a transitional period. It's not easy for them to be just working as an open source developer. It used to be a hobby, it used to be a passion. Having it as a job changes a lot of things. Also, when you work or you work eight hours a day as an open source developer, you don't have the same kind of freedom that you had as, a, as an open source developer before because you have to focus on, focus on specific projects or specific areas of a specific project. So it becomes more, it gets a corporate taste, I would say, which is not also easy to manage. It takes some time. The team is also all separated. Uh, in our company, we have the OSPO completely separate from uh, the rest of, well, I wouldn't say from the company, but the rest of the engineering efforts. We have independent goals, independent timelines. We have a different team structure and report lines. In most OSPOs, you have the team embedded within the organization in some sort of way. And some companies even have one OSPO developer on each team or two OSPO developers on each team. But we have a completely different team with our own director and managers and set of developers. And that also comes with its own challenges in creating a team culture, yeah, helping the team feel as part of the company. That also becomes a big challenge as time goes on because you don't really attach to the company goals. You have different goals. You have different timelines. The company releases its products let's say every uh, specific cycle, open source projects have different release timelines, not the same. Could be six months, could be a year, depending on the, the project, really. The team is extrospective. The team's efforts are all at outwards, unlike the rest of the company, where they work together towards developing something inwards and then sharing it with the rest of the world. Your team shares every single line of code or every single um, blog they write, they, they, they write, talk they give with, with people outside of the company, which is quite different. The projects are shared with the community. Even if the company owns a project, you still have the community in mind. You're not doing this for your company, you're doing it for the rest of the community and for people to use, basically. Uh, projects are administrated by foundations, like the Apache Foundations. It's not yours. You can decide timelines. You can decide what happens when. So this also comes with its own struggle, as a manager at least. And community engagement, of course. The team, as I said, engages with the community in everything they do. That also, when it comes to uh, people management, that also comes with its own set of uh, difficulties we'll talk about in the next slides. Team separation within the team itself. We talked about separation from the rest of the org or the rest of the company. Within the team itself, you have people working on separate projects. It could be just one person working on each project or two people working on one project. There's a lot of difficulties when it comes to building team harmony, team culture, stuff like that, when you have people working on separate projects. Individuals working alone, as I said, it could be have some one person working on a project alone. It depends on the person's personality, but it could be quite challenging for some people. Different stacks, and gets harder with this part because um, developers usually bond on what they're working on. So if they're working on stuff from different domains and different stacks, it's a bit harder to form this team culture, team bonding experience. So these are the attributes of an OSPO team that is focused upstream. There are a bit more stuff, but these are the most challenging and important stuff, basically, that I've seen. And here are the struggle areas that come with these attributes, basically, and trying to fix them, basically. So there are four, I would say, pillars or four core um, yeah, four core pairs that managing any software team, basically, you have to focus on these. Team, uh, building a team culture, having a way to have goals and plan for the team's future, measuring performance and tracking performance, making sure everyone is on the right track, 
and growing the careers of the developers. This is not in any particular order. If I would order them, I would put career growth at the start because that's the most important thing, making sure that people are growing every day. But these are the most important uh, areas that you need to monitor as a manager, basically. Starting with culture, as I said, that would be a bit difficult given that the team first is in different time zones, different countries, works on different stuff. We have a few stuff that we try at our team. We create something called chapters or sub-teams. People working on stuff that are a bit similar, we try to group them together and have some, time, some sort of uh, team routine, um, some ceremonies that product teams have basically. But it's, yeah, we try to have this in project-based fashion stack-based fashion or domain uh, fashion. So people working on the same project, obviously it would be easier to have ceremonies together. Uh, stack-based, people working on the same language or in the same area could have this sort of thing. Domain-based, people working on streaming, get together. People working on databases, get together. We try to divide them in this uh, shape or form. Knowledge sharing across chapters, even after we have small divisions within the team, we try to have as many ceremonies as possible that group the whole team together, basically, where we share knowledge across different teams, across different projects. It doesn't have to be very technical, just even release issues or release uh, progress between projects, and we can learn from each other, basically, and each, people, each person working on a different project can share what happened to them in the other project, and so on. Midday team uh, social slot, which turns into sort of rambling by most people. <laughs> we just talk about random stuff, really, because we're not in the same area. We don't see each other physically maybe uh, two or three times a year. So it's, uh, we have about like, 30, 45 minutes every day to have this team bonding moment, 45 minutes where we talk about just random stuff. We share some of the stuff that we face during the day, some technical, some non-technical. It does help foster, uh, foster a good team culture uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And as I mentioned, regional team meetups try to meet like two, three times a year. We use conferences like this one also to uh, see each other because this is what we're all about, basically, open source uh, conferences. So this also helps a lot in the face-to-face -face interaction. So goals and planning. And then when it comes to planning for the future of the team or what areas the team needs to work on, that's quite difficult given that we do not own any of the projects. You can say in the next six months, we will get this uh, developed or get this implemented because it's not our decision, it's the community's decision. And we cannot also foresee what the community will care about in the next period. We can read what's important now, what the company, uh, sorry, what the community cares about now. We know what the company cares about now. We try to keep a balance between both, but it's also not that straightforward. So we have a few methods that we practice so we can try to keep that going. Uh, we have roadmaps in six months period, which is a bit longer than what uh, normal product teams have. They usually work in quarters or sprints of two, uh, two or three weeks, but open source projects are very different. You can have a PR sit for like eight months and nobody's even thumbs up, so it's quite difficult to work in a normal fashion, like two or three weeks or even a month. So we have road mapping of six months where we take into account first the community needs, what the community wants to see in the project in the next period, urgent bugs and vulnerabilities that we also have that always have that buffer in our um, in our timeline basically for urgent bugs and vulnerabilities and strategic priorities from the company basically what the company wants to see in the project we try to balance that as much as possible with community needs but we also keep that in mind and how do we build that backlog of strategic priorities we have a weekly sync with the product team uh, how are they using the, the project? What would it, what they like to see in the project? Well, how can we help? How can we push things forward? That's what we talk about every week. We ensure aligning community goals with organizational goals, and that's the most difficult part of the entire job, basically, and it's not 100% doable. You have to sacrifice one over the other every now and then. Uh, there isn't really a one-size-fits-all when it comes to this, this, uh, this part. But usually, sticking with the community needs on the long run helps even the organizational goals, basically. So, and that's what I've seen, at least, from what we've been working on. Whatever we wanted to have in right now, and we had to sacrifice and wait for a bit, eventually came through at the right time. Uh, performance, which is one of those things that is also quite easy, not easy to measure, but also there's a blueprint to measure when it comes to product teams. You have a set of features or a set of uh, some people measure 
uh, code contributions, how big they are, or how important they are. People, some people measure what the team has delivered in terms of uh, tasks from the backlog uh, within the past period. That's also quite uh, different when it comes to OSPOs. We measure contributions on three basic uh, pillars. One, pull requests. What have we contributed? Is it all one-liners, non-important stuff? Is it uh, just typos that we're fixing? Of course, that wouldn't be very efficient. NPR reviews, and that's very important for us because we want to give back to the community twice as much as we're uh, taking. So if we're submitting five features, we want to review at least twice that number when it comes to PRs to help the community push stuff that they care about forward. People who have stuff sitting, uh, PRs sitting for like four or five months, we want, to, we want to help push that forward and help them get them through the door, basically. And last but not least, community support, answering questions on uh, blogs, forums, even Slack messages. We also take all of that into account while measuring someone's performance, basically. Community impact, how are we helping push the project forward? Because it's not just code that pushes the project forward. There are a lot of things that push the project forward. One of them is new contributors. In the projects that we have maintainers in, are we helping get new contributors into the project, helping them get their first contribution in? Are we getting new, diverse maintainers? Are we helping different people become maintainers in the projects, not always people from the same pool? And make sure, uh, making sure that the project is healthy, and that's by diversifying the contributors, sorry, the maintainers list, basically. It's not all from one company, it's all, not all a specific, uh, from a specific de uh, demographic. We try to help have a diverse pool of maintainers for each project that we contribute to. And last, internal support. As I mentioned, we do get requests from our team, stuff that they'd like to see fixed, uh, stuff that they'd like to see pushed forward, basically, in the project. That also, how much have we been helpful for our internal team? That's also part of how we measure performance. And last but not least, community media presence, stuff like this. How much are we sharing the knowledge that we have? How much are we talking about what we know and what we can give back to the community? Per year, how, much, how many times have we spoken about that? That's also part of how we measure uh, the performance of an OSPO developer. Next, career growth, which is also tricky. If you're a C++ developer or a Rust developer on a product team, it's, there's also a blueprint how you can help someone like that grow. What would you like to work on? What kind of projects? What kind of areas in our project that we offer at the company that you'd like to work on? But when it comes to an OSPO developer, it's a bit different. And goal setting specifically becomes challenging. How can you set a goal for someone who works in a project that you have no control over, basically? But we also have a few methods that we try to do. We try to help people set goals that align with their own personal goals. What areas would they like to improve on? What languages would they, would they like to learn? What a specific tech stack they'd like to uh, improve in? And make sure that their goal setting would also align with the community goals. If you would like to grow in a specific area, let's place you in a project where the community cares about that area, where that area is growing in the current time period. And also aligns with organizational goals. And that's so it's a difficult uh, balance, but we do our best in trying to maintain it, basically. Project awards, we try to, well, we're setting the goals, basically, help people put realistic targets that they'd like to work to. If you're someone who's working in a, in a Apache project, for example, we try to help people reach committer status or become on the uh, PMC members, because for an OSPO developer, that is the actual, uh, says where this actual satisfaction comes from or the recognition they would feel comes from becoming a committer or a project. That's how they feel they've done what they can do for the community, basically. So that's one of the goals I try to set to help people further their career. And of course, build, building media presence, talking about what they've done, what they've been through, the stuff that they've worked on. All of this would package into having an OSPO developer profile, basically, which is not a very common thing. But if you look at it, that's what you would expect for someone who's working 100% of their time on open source. They would talk about what they're doing, share their knowledge with other people. They would get to a status where they can actually help with uh, pushing projects forward. And we, they would set that as their own personal goals. That is all I have for today. Uh, this QR code would link you to the slides and you can download them. And thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know.